Jones. I'm the designated federal officer for the North American Number Council, or the Nancy, and I'm calling the July 28, 2020 Nancy meeting to order. At today's meeting, the Nancy will receive updates from the Secure Telephone Identity Governance Authority and the North American Portability Management, LLC. It will also receive a presentation on a proposed enhanced universal drug rehabilitation hotline from Pamela Roach, a Washington Pierce County Council member. For voting purposes, the Nancy will discuss reports from its interoperable video calling working group and its nationwide number portability working group. With that, I'll turn the meeting over to the Nancy Chair, Jennifer McKee. Jennifer? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this meeting of the North American Number Council. Um, this is our second meeting in July, so it's good to have everyone back together again in this busy month. We welcome members of the public who are watching via live stream and encourage you to submit any questions you may have to livequestions at FCC.gov. Your questions will be read during the public participation portion of the meeting. Before we begin, I want to again review uh, for council members the best practices for our virtual meeting. Please keep your phone on mute if you are not speaking. Uh, if you need to take another call or leave the meeting momentarily, please do not put the call on hold as some systems may play hold music that will interfere with the meeting. Instead, you can leave your line on mute or temporarily jump off the call and then rejoin when you can. Those of us who are on the WebEx should disable the video function. You may see a button on your screen with a camera on it. Please make sure that function is off. This will help the meeting to run more smoothly. If you have a question or comment during designated discussion time, there are three ways that you can let us know. First of all, you can let us know by raising your hand electronically using the raise hand function on WebEx. There are circular item, icons along the bottom of your screen. Select participants which will show you a list of all those on the meeting. The raise hand icon should appear when you put your mouse over your name. You may be listed as you. Click on it and it will let us know that you want to speak. Marilyn will track who raises a hand and at the end of an agenda segment, you can address your question. Once we call on you, you can unmute your phone to ask your question. When you're finished, please unclick the icon to turn off the raise hand functions so that we know you no longer have a question or comment. The meeting host cannot control the raise hand function, so we ask each of you to unclick your own icons once your questions have been answered, and we'll do our best to monitor this function. If you're having difficulty with the raise hand function, you can also ask a question by using the WebEx chat feature. You can send a message to Marilyn as the host. These will not be made public, so Marilyn will read the question aloud for the group. Lastly, as a final measure, or if you want to respond to a question that has been asked, you can simply unmute your phone. If you go with this option, please remember to identify yourself when you speak. We may not recognize your voice. Please also remember to put your phone back on mute when you are done speaking. As we move through the agenda and any questions arise, Marilyn or I will verbally pass the mic to those of you who are presenting. Again, we are trying to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to be heard in an orderly fashion. We will be voting on recommendations during this meeting. Please remember to unmute your phones when I call for motions and for votes and then put yourself back on mute. Does anyone have any questions on the technical aspects of the meeting before we begin? Okay, hearing none, um, a reminder, uh, members of the public with questions for the Nancy were asked to submit comments via the commission's electronic comment filing system. Members of the public watching the live stream can also ask a question by sending it via email to livequestions at fcc.gov. Submitted questions will be read live during the public participation portion of the meeting. Now, before we begin the meeting, do any members need to make any disclosures? Okay, hearing none. Um, I'd like to ask my uh, vice chair, uh, Bruce Williamson, do you have any comments or remarks that you would like to make before we begin? No, I do not. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, thanks, Bruce. I'll turn the meeting back over to our designated federal official, Marilyn Jones, who will conduct the roll call. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Jennifer, I see, I see that Chairman Pye is on, on the WebEx. So uh, if, if you'd like, you can give his remarks first so he doesn't have to hang around for our, our roll call. Oh, certainly. Okay. I'm not Thank sure you. what his schedule is like. Chairman Pai, would you like to uh, to go ahead and give your remarks at this time?
I'm not sure you can hear us yet. Oh, okay. Jeff, are you there? Jeff, can you tell if he's logged into the to the to the bridge? Okay, in the meantime, while we get that taken care of, let me do the roll call. Okay, General uh, Heather Barrows from 800 Response has informed me that she will not be present at this meeting. So we will start the roll call with ACA Connect. See anyone here from ACA Connect? Ad Hoc Telecommunications. Hi, Marilyn. Susan Gately here for Ad Hoc. Hi, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Addis. Good morning, Jackie Welchum is present. Thank you, Jackie. AT&T. Uh, good morning, Ola Oyepusi from at and Good morning, Ola. Van Wett. Lisa Joe Freeman. Good morning, Greg and Lisa. Charter. Betty Sanders, good morning. Good morning, Betty. Tom Cass. Good morning, Tim Cagle. Good morning, Tim. Uh, CCA. Good morning, Marilyn. It's Alexi Malthus for CCA. Good morning, Alexi. CTIA. Good morning, Marilyn. This is Matt DeTora, a uh, designated alternate for Matt Gerst, who couldn't be here this morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Matt. Welcome. Google. Morning, Marilyn. This is Craig Leonard. Morning, Craig. Encompass. Yes, good morning. This is Chris Shipley from Encompass. Good morning, Chris. Entrado. Bob McCausland is here for Entrado Communications. Good morning. Good morning, Bob. Uh, Nehru. Good morning, Marilyn. This is Karen Charles Peterson. Good morning, Commissioner Charles Peterson. Uh, Nasuka. Good morning, Barry Hobbins representing Nasuka. Good morning, Barry. Good morning. NTCA. Good morning, Marilyn. Brian Ford from NTCA is here. Good morning, Brian. Welcome. Nevada Public Utilities Commission. Good morning, Haley Williamson. Good morning, Commissioner Williamson. Peerless Network. Good morning. This is Julie Ose for Peerless Network. Good morning, Julie. Tip Forum. Rich Saki here. Good morning, Rich. Uh, TDS. Good morning. Paul Lajabo is here. Good morning, Paul. Telnet. Good morning. Good morning, Marilyn. David Keith here. Good morning, David. Uh, did I hear Sarah also? Yes, yep. I'm here as well. Thanks, Marilyn. Okay. Thank you. Uh, T Mobile. Hey, good morning. This is Scott Farm. This is T-Mobile. Morning, Scott. Uh, Twilio. Morning. Anyone from Twilio? U.S. Connect. Good morning, Marilyn. Bridget Alexander White on. Morning, Bridget. U.S. Telecom. Hi. Good morning. It's Mike Saperstein. Morning, Mike. Verizon. Morning. Good morning, Marilyn. Santa Crandall. Good morning, Dana. Uh, Vonage. Good morning. This is Alan Vasquez representing Vonage. Good morning, Alan. Uh, I connected. Is Glenn here Rebel from I is here from I connected. Good morning, Glenn. Thanks, Marilyn. Good morning. Uh, Somo. Hi, Ann's here, Berkowitz. Good morning, Ann. Did I miss anyone? Did ACA Connect show up? Nope. Okay, that concludes the roll call. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair McKee. Okay, thanks very much, Marilyn.
Uh, I'm now pleased to welcome this morning G. Pai, Chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, who will be joining us for some opening remarks. Uh, Chairman Pai, the call is yours. Oh, well, thanks so much. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair McKee, and to Vice Chair Williamson, and everybody on the call, all the members of the NANCY. Uh, I understand that the NANCY uh, began live streaming its meetings via the FCC's website in May, and uh, I apologize for not appearing uh, over video. I just had some connection issues, uh, but uh, thank you for letting me be on the call itself. Uh, as you know, for more than two decades, the FCC has asked the NANCY to come up with recommendations on the way forward on some pretty complex numbering issues. And that's in part because you bring to the table so much technical expertise and experience and diverse viewpoints uh, from across the public and private sectors. And I know that this has always been challenging work. Uh, we have certainly not shied away from sending you extremely complicated and occasionally controversial issues, but I don't think we've ever had to ask you to do that work under the circumstances that we're dealing with today. Uh, of course, those of us who are fortunate enough to be able to work from home have been doing so for months, and many of us have also been juggling the demands with uh, of the job with other demands, uh, need to uh, educate kids or entertain them, uh, care with for others, some of whom are high risk, and do all of the other things uh, that are necessary during our daily lives. And so I know that this uh, task has been uh, difficult for many of you. Um, now, while it has made our jobs more challenging, I also think that it has also underscored the importance of our work and the importance of the Nancy's work in particular. As we all know by this point, telecommunications is the bridge that connects us to essential services and support. It allows us as patients to connect with uh, healthcare providers without risking further exposure either to patients or to the providers. It also allows teachers to connect with students, uh, to give them lesson plans and to review homework and the like. And it, of course, uh, most fundamentally allows us to connect with those we love who we might not be able to see physically, a friend or a loved one or somebody in the community who helps us feel less isolated. And so the Nancy in particular, I think, has done an important job in, over the last several months and years in increasing access to these critical communication services and the support that they can provide by sharing expert advice with the commission. And I want to commend you for two particular issues that are important to me. Uh, first and foremost is all of the advice and counsel you gave us on a three-digit dialing code for national suicide prevention and mental health uh, as you know, that culminated in the designation of 988 as the three-digit dialing code to reach the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, a decision we made earlier this month. And I can tell you that I still hear uh, over email and tweets and all kinds of other ways about what a difference this is going to make in the lives of the American people. And I hope that once this number goes live on July 16th of 2022, that all of you will feel a sense of pride, deserved pride, in knowing that you've been able to help those millions of Americans who are struggling with those who are able to help. I also want to thank you for your work on the Stir Shaken framework, which, of course, allows providers to authenticate caller ID and to mitigate spoofing and illegal robocalling. Uh, believe it or not, even during the pandemic, the robocallers are still out there unleashing their uh, will on American consumers, and you've done great work helping us to authenticate some of these phone calls to prevent consumers from being bombarded further. Now, I understand that today uh, the Nancy will be considering working group recommendations on interoperable video calling uh, to make video calls between 10-digit telephone numbers simpler for consumers, including those with hearing and speech disabilities. And another topic is going to be nationwide number portability, which would allow consumers to do things like uh, find employment in a different area of the country without having to change those 10-digit phone numbers that their friends, family members, and other contacts use to reach them. Both these issues are important in helping us keep connected, and that, of course, as I mentioned earlier, has never been more important than it is right now. Uh, the Nancy, I understand, is also poised to take up a further report on caller ID authentication and implementing congressional direction in the Trace Act in September. Uh, so uh, to sum it up, I guess I would say that you have full plates, but that's nothing new. Of course, you've had full plates for quite a while uh, because of all that we've foisted on them. And so I just want to say thank you to everybody. In particular, our chair, Jennifer McKee, and our vice chair, Bruce Williamson, and to everybody for taking the time out of your days, especially under such difficult circumstances, to do the heavy lifting on these important issues. And I also want to say that I look forward to the day when we can all see each other in person again safely. And until that day comes, I want to 
just express uh, my appreciation once more and say uh, that uh, everyone should stay safe and be well in the time to come. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Chairman Pai. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us this morning. Okay, so we'll move on to our um, announcements and we do have a membership update. So pursuant to the merger of the companies earlier this year, T-Mobile has assumed the seat that was previously held by Sprint and will be represented by Rosemary Least as the primary representative and Scott Fryermuth as the alternative representative. We know Rosemary and Scott from their work uh, as previous representatives on the NANCY and its working groups, and we know that they will continue to make the great contributions they've made in the past as they serve in their new positions. So congratulations on your appointment. Thank now, you. the next Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining us, Scott. Um, the next thing on our agenda is we're going to have an update from Brent Struthers, um, who is the director of the Secure Telephone Identity Governance Authority. Uh, Brent, if you are there, I hope oh, your slides are up. So the call is yours. Good morning, Chair McKee. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great, great. I um, want to echo Chairman Pye's comments about being thankful to be able to work from home, and I would add that I'm thankful just to be able to work when there's so many people that are not able to work right now. So. In that vein, I would like to say that I'm thrilled that the, the work of the STIGA and the STIPA and the STICAs that are multiplying now um, has just gone on um, without losing a step, without losing a beat. Um, so we, we've continued to sign up providers. Um, we currently have 34 active service providers. Those are the folks that have gone all the way through the testing and signed their contracts. Um, we've got an additional nine service providers that have gotten through the testing but are still working on their final paperwork. And then we've got 52, um, the list is piling up, that have provided their 499A forms, their proof of direct access to telephone numbers and their OCN, and are uh, ready for the testing portion or going through the testing portion now. Um, so we've got quite a few providers working on it. Um, and like I said, it just uh, the, the PA really hasn't missed a beat with all the, the COVID and work from home stuff. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, reminder to those service providers that might be waiting until the last minute to register with the STIPA, whether it's for a, a California mandate in December or the FCC mandate, the larger FCC mandate next year. Um, we expect there to be a large number of providers coming to register, uh, especially next summer with the FCC deadline. So well, I can't give you an average time. It's taking service providers to pass through the registration process. Um, there's a lot of variation among the different providers. Uh, it's a process that's taking almost all service providers weeks and not days to complete. So um, for those service providers working towards the, the June 30, 2021 FCC mandate, don't wait until the last minute to begin your STIPA registration process, please, because you may not make it. Um, certification authorities, good news there. We now have six um, STIGA board approved um, certificate authorities. Um, four of those, NetNumber, Newstar, Sensei, and TransNexus, are all serving the, the broader industry. Um, the board's made significant strides in ensuring a competitive um, certificate authority model, and there's at least one other very likely candidate in the pipeline, and I'm, I'm hoping they'll be approved very soon. So that would give us five. Um, so we've made tremendous strides there. Um, in terms of funding, during my last update in May, I noted that the, the SCIGA board was in the process of reviewing the funding that we had received to that point in 2020 in order to determine the funding level requirement for the remainder of this year. Um, the board's now actually looking at the 2021 funding levels. Um, the board plans to announce the contribution factor um, in time for service providers to take that into consideration for their 2021 budgeting process. So that means pretty soon we'll be releasing the contribution factors so service providers can figure out what they'll be paying for 2021. Um, I think the last issue is on policy. Um, uh, I guess we've got some outreach too. So policy efforts, um, the board is discussing potential changes to the, the current SBC token access policy, the SBC token is what providers need to get when they register with the with the policy administrator so they can go then get their digital certificate so they can sign calls. So we're considering, the board's considering making changes to that SBC token access policy and that may potentially allow a broader set of service providers to gain direct access to the ecosystem. Um, the board's exploring options that will ensure, one, the security safeguards um, that it put in place uh, 
um, to protect the ecosystem. We want to make sure that those safeguards are maintained and not lowered. Uh, the last time I reported that the, the board was developing a process to also revoke SBC tokens for service providers that may misuse their access to the ecosystem um, in some way. Uh, the board's continuing its work on this and will post that uh, revocation policy when it's complete. And in case you want to know more about what's going on, um, uh, for those who have not seen it, uh, Linda Vandeloup, uh, the SDIGA board chair, and I spoke at the recent SIP Forum Virtual Summit. It's a terrific event. Um, we provided an update on the board and its activities, and that presentation was recorded, and it's still available via the SIP Forum website, and I'm sure Rich can tell you all about that. Um, the board's considering further outreach efforts to educate industry on the registration process and the timelines that I already warned you about. Um, as well as some, on some industry standards and uh, reports on how carriers um, without direct access to TNs and or operating company numbers may be able to ensure their calls are also signed. So we're working on some outreach, and I'll have some more to report to you in the very near to report to you in the very near future. And that's all I have. Do y'all have any questions? Mary Hobbins, your hand is raised. Do you have a question? I'm sorry. Plug, by the way. Inadvert inadvertently uh, pushed the button. I apologize. You're welcome, Rich. Anyway, it's nice to hear from you, Barry, either way. Hey, thanks. You're doing a good job. <laughs> thanks. All right, Marilyn. I have the hands raised. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brent. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Brent. We appreciate it. Thanks for the update. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Teresa Patton, who is co-chair of the North American Portability Management LLC. So, Teresa, I will turn the call over to you. Thank you, Chairman McKee. Uh, as you can tell, I am not Teresa Patton. You this is Tim Cagle. <laughs> this is Tim Cagle. I work for Comcast. I'm one of the co-chairs of the North American Portability Management LLC. I do share that role with my close colleague. Teresa Patton from AT&T, and uh, we're pleased to bring you the July uh, 2020 NANSA report. So um, just, you know, one general comment as we all sort of work through this pandemic uh, with COVID-19, I just wanted to point out that uh, iConnective, our NPAC vendor, has continued to provide quality support by working remotely in all of the NPAC um, regions. So um, very good support. Uh, hopefully service providers uh, have experienced that and, and echo the sentiment. In terms of uh, general activities here, the uh, NAPM LLC did respond to a written set of questions that was received from the Nancy IVC working group regarding the potential use of the NPAC to support interoperable video calling. And we also met with the IVC working group on May 21st to discuss the responses. The NAPM LLC's response and discussion is incorporated into the Nancy IVC working group's record. Uh, next, the uh, NPAC release schedule, uh, release 4.5 is currently available for optional user testing. Production deployment on July 26 for the Southeast region and August 9th for all other regions is on track. Uh, release 5.0 is available for optional user testing beginning in early August. Vendor testing has already begun uh, with six LSMSs complete four SOAs complete, two SOAs slash LSMS in progress, and seven SOA slash LSMSs not yet started. Production upgrade, all regions will flash cut on October the 25th, and an extended maintenance window notice was sent to the industry on April 29th. So that covers all of the NPAC uh, release schedules. In terms of contract implementation committee or kick reviews, 
uh, in partnership with our vendor, iConnective, the KIC reviewed one finding report of providers of telecommunications related services uh, to validate the need for NPAC data access. As of May 25th, there were 56 service providers that had not yet completed the 2020 annual certification qualification process or ACQ. And the ACQ documentation and process requirements for PTRS users for 2021 is being modified. So that is the end of our report. Let me just pause to see if there are any questions from the Nancy. Okay, not hearing any. So thank you very much, Tim. We really appreciate that report. Thank you, Chair McKee. And if anybody has a uh, uh, follow-up or expresses interest in uh, becoming a NAPM LLC member, please don't hesitate to reach out to either Teresa or myself. Thanks very much, Chair McKee. Back to you. Okay, thanks, Tim. Okay, next on our agenda, we have a short uh, break. So we're going to take um, just 10 minutes. Uh, go grab some coffee. <laughs> and then we're going to leave the phone bridge and WebEx open. If you need to disconnect, uh, you can call back in using the same phone number and the access code. If you decide to stay logged in, just remember to leave your line on mute we, so we don't hear you making your coffee while you're gone. And we'll be back. Um, let's see. Looks like it's. How about. Looks yep. like 10. Come back at 10 10. How about that? Thanks, everybody. My gosh. Okay, well, we're happy you finally made it on, council member. Um, welcome. Uh, Pamela Roach is a council member from Pierce County, Washington, and she is going to give us a presentation on a proposed enhanced universal drug rehabilitation hotline. Um, thank you, council member Roach. Apologize for the, uh, the IT issues, but we're glad to have you. <laughs> we have reserved 20 minutes for your presentation and 10 minutes for questions from the council afterwards. So whenever you are ready, Please proceed. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pam Roach, and I'm a Pierce County. There's some um, channel noise in the back. I don't know if you hear that. I am a, a Pierce County Council member uh, presently, and I served in the Washington State Senate for 26 years. I put my phone number and my email address up there, so I hope you'll all feel very free to get hold of me if you'd like to. Next slide, please. Uh, Enhanced 211 Universal Drug Rehabilitation Hotline. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman and Marilyn Jones. I'm not sure who's there today. And the members of the Numbering Council for hearing my proposal today regarding the establishment of Enhanced 211, a Universal Drug Rehabilitation Hotline. If implemented, this augmentation of the existing 211 programs would link individuals and families seeking addiction help uh, directly to the help they desperately seek. There's a very, there is a huge lag there. Are you there? We're here. Yeah. Council Member Roach, do you, have, do you have a screen open that has the live stream open, perhaps? I, I have the, the screen that has a screenshot of an enhanced, uh, I, I have that in front of me. So what's happening on my end is I'm hearing myself speak at a huge delay. It's coming through my phone. So I okay. hear myself way up. So I don't know how to keep myself from hearing myself. I don't know that to go on or to wait. Why don't you go on? The reason why I was asking is if, if somebody's watching through the live screen and on a different computer, you might hear a delay from the live stream. But if all you have is, is your phone, then you should be on the same system we are. And so you can go ahead and proceed, and, and we'll try to follow along with you. Okay. Well, I do have this echo in the back of me talking. Is that usual? 
I'll just go ahead and pick up. Next slide, please. This presentation will explain what is meant by enhanced 211. We'll have a description of current systems. We'll talk about implementation and that it's an opt-in choice for local efforts uh, to place if they care to. It will recount the need for enhanced 211. Drug abuse is rampant and users have difficulty finding help. This, it will describe why existing 211 is the number to use. We have existing familiarity with the number. The cost is low to implement. It's easy to remember. Covers the entire country. Like 911, it unifies efforts and responses. And it can be etched into the back of the phones. Next slide, please. This presentation uh, will list who supports 211. Uh, United Way USA. Also, the National Association of Counties. In fact, there was a unanimous floor vote of 2,500 local elected county officials representing a membership of 40,000 elected officials across the country. And Raptor, uh, you won't know what that is, but it's Rural Action Plan Tracking Opioids. Uh, the USDA sponsored, uh, it has a huge program uh, regarding um, trying to help people with addictions, and they support this measure. Actually, all people that I've talked to about it are very supportive. This presentation will describe why having consistency is important. It promotes national leadership in the coordinating of efforts. And like 911, 211 will be a, a unifier among those in need. Next slide, please. Maybe some of you have tried it. You've called 211, and you know it is locally administered and it usually is operated by United Way. That helps those in need, uh, they, then it helps those in need find the services they need. But did you know the response uh, given to the 211 caller varies from state to state and even county to county within states? And to the point of this discussion, sometimes help for the drug addicted is available and sometimes it's not. Next slide. In Washington State, there are seven 211 regions. In my Washington State County, if you call 211, you get a general information message board, which varies during the month or during the year. One month, it's a reminder to pay your taxes. And this takes several minutes, by the way. These are bulletin boards that go on and on. Another message points out locations uh, no longer honoring food stamps. Another may give reasons and how to be counted in the census. Then the line takes you to a variety of services offered. Next slide, please. Press one for housing, press two for job training. Oh, and press three for food assistance. There's no button for help with drug addiction. For drug-related issues, instead, a robo-voice gives you several different phone numbers and a couple of websites. If you're on the street and seeking help, You've hung up before getting to the point of the confusing numbers and websites. If you wait for an operator and you say you have a drug issue, they immediately ask if you have children. That is another hang-up point, as most people don't want their children taken from them. That's understandable, right? Nevada has one 211 call center for the entire state. Next slide, please. San Diego County has its own huge sprawling center for 211. The systems are different, but the ideal is to have a dedicated line for those seeking help with drug abuse and have a kind of have a kind and understanding non-threatening person on the other side of the line as the person taking the call. Next slide please. E211 creates a more direct and therefore more effective way to help those on the street or still with their families get the help they seek. Next slide. Enhanced 211 is a branch off or a split to a drug line support. We call 211 and the very first thing all callers hear is something like, thank you for calling 211. If you or someone you know needs help in overcoming addiction, please press one now. Then after that opportunity, the dialogue would pick up with the bulletin board and the numbers to select. 
all other services take a second seat to the drug addiction line. If the caller presses one, they are sent directly to those who are working the drug issue. Before COVID-19, drug addiction was the most serious health, social, and crime problem in the United States. And similar to COVID-19, you either die with an addiction or you're treated and survive. Next slide. Implementing 211 is easy. It's just line splitting. It's very inexpensive to implement. Funding is needed to split the line, so those needing help are immediately sent to it. Uh, to do this, we update the current phone systems. And there would be an online information campaign so local 211 centers would know they can opt in if they'd like to do that. And that part costs nothing. Next slide, please. Joshua Pedersen of United Way 211 in Alexandria, Virginia, knows what it costs. Before joining the 211 team at the United Way International Headquarters, Mr. Pedersen worked for the state of Maryland on these issues. Without going through the legislative process, then Governor Bob Ehrlich used funds available to him to split the lines. The amount allocated was around $60,000. The technical work required was only $15,000. So there was uh, funding left over, which was used to install a new, new call center phones. Mr. Pedersen is a great local resource for you. He's just there in, uh, in Virginia. To announce uh, the availability of funding for line splitting, there would need to be announcements through federal, state, and local agencies, 211 International, nonprofits centered on drug addiction issues, local and state elected officials, legislative bodies, and media outlets. When good things are offered, there are takers. Next slide. Yes, we can make these lines work in a better way. <laughs> Next slide. All 211 operations are local. The call centers are operated locally and services are rendered at a local level. E211 is a, not a government mandate. Local control is maintained. Danny Melgoza is assistant to San Diego Supervisor Greg Cox. I spent an entire day with Danny going through their 211 system. Danny characterized the importance of this enhanced 211 situation this way. He said, programs and services are only as good as their accessibility. 211 is a central point for residents to access services that are provided by county government and local partners. Next slide. Thank you. This is a screenshot taken from a TV ad that I ran. This went um, through, I'd say half of Pierce County. Uh, this frame of that TV ad was also put on the front page of the Tacoma News Tribune. And the interesting thing, you notice my own number. I'm from District 2, and when I took office, I changed my number to represent the district, 2222. I think it's important if you want someone to uh, get a hold of you that you make the number as easy as possible. So here's what we know. Drug abuse is rampant, and users have difficulty finding help. I ran this ad because I wanted to reach out and help people. We took calls to my office for three months off of this ad that only ran one week. It was really amazing, and my, my staff was scrambling to find help for the people that called. So we do know that help is needed. Uh, next slide, please. So 211, is it the number to use? Well, if you want someone to call you, you make the number easy to remember to the point of being familiar, okay? These slides uh, taken by yours truly, this was outside of Las Vegas, and these are attorneys who want you to call them. Next slide, please. This is a uh, cab in Singapore. So worldwide, they know how important it is to have easy numbers. Next slide, please. This is a cab in Fort Lauderdale. Next slide, please. This is just right around the corner from my house. Uh, 887 7777. So if you want someone to call, you make the number as easy to remember to the point of being familiar. 211 is easy to remember, and 211 is a familiar number. Next slide, please. 
So why is 211 the number to use? Well, first thing is it covers the entire country, 95.69%. You'll notice the area, we see Illinois there. Chicago, interestingly enough, has, does not use 211. Don't know why, but in any event, uh, we're at 95.6%. 211 can be etched on the back of distributed phones. Many of the homeless have phones that are given to them, and you can etch that in the back so they'll always know who to call if they have some uh, help that's needed. The cost to implement is low, as we've talked about. Like 911, it unifies efforts and responses. Next slide, please. So who supports uh, using uh, E211? United Way USA, the National Association of Counties, by way of resolution. This was unanimously passed by the 2,500 elected officials in attendance. I was there, of course. And, um, and that, uh, the resolution passed in 2019. Um, Raptor, which is, as I described, the Rural Action Plan tackling opioid recovery, and all individuals that I've talked to think it's a great idea. Next slide, please. This is a picture of uh, the presentation place for, for Raptor. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, me presenting the resolution to the Las Vegas Committee. Um, please review the attached uh, NACO resolution, which was presented to the Human Services Committee. Uh, next slide. And was passed by the General Assembly, representing the 40,000 members. Last week, though not uh, in General Assembly due to the current health restrictions, it was passed again for the next calendar year. The goal is to keep the addicted when they are, or the goal is to help the addicted when they are ready to make that call and they need immediate access to a system. I'm asking you today to embrace the enhanced 211 policy and make a recommendation to the Federal Communications Commission that it be adopted and implemented as federal policy. The National Association of Counties is also making this request. The, quote, resolution to support linking 211 lines with substance use disorder crisis lines E211 is a request from the very leaders who help fund and implement the current 211 programs within the states, the local elected officials. These are the leaders who get the calls. What do we do? How can I help my loved one? We're the ones that get the calls. Next slide, please. So the benefits are clear. Three things. One, a dedicated line with a familiar number would help the drug addicted get access to drug rehabilitation. Two, the mechanics are simple. 211 is already established as a national network. Three, the policy idea is widely accepted by local elected officials across the country. Please put your support behind Enhance 211. I want to thank you for um, hearing about this today and. Um, so I'm very, very happy to, I want to thank the, your staff, too. We had a little trouble getting in today, but it worked. So I'd like to uh, ask you if you have any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Bob McCausland has a couple of questions from Entrado. Bob? Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Council Member Roach, for the presentation. Uh, I am a member of the North American Numbering Council and a co-chair of the Numbering Administration Oversight Working Group. And uh, I and some of my colleagues here on the North American Numbering Council were quite engaged in uh, reviewing uh, 211 and the other three-digit dialing codes associated with the um, uh, suicide and crisis hotline uh, issues. Um, uh, one of my questions for you is, are you a member of or have you been a member of the Alliance of Information and Referral Systems, AIRS, uh, and uh, are you uh, engaged in dialogue with Clive Jones and Catherine Ray of AIRS? And if so, what is their uh, viewpoint of uh, your suggestions? Thank you. Well, I have not talk to them. I'm afraid I didn't know about them. Uh, I'm a local elected official who's been doing local work for uh, almost 30 years, and I haven't had it. The only airs I know, I'm a ham radio operator, and I think Aries, maybe it's not the same thing. 
Uh, but I, no, I don't know. Be happy to chat with them, of course. Okay, thank you. I don't have any further questions. While there's a lull, could I add something? Certainly, go ahead. You know, I, I, I focused on what happens when you call 211, but I, I have to tell you that if you try the outside, it's even it's even harder. Uh, just yesterday, I called 253-456-6868. Uh, it was a multi-care general, Tacoma General Hospital. A substance abuse disorders is what it said in the uh, website. And it was a, a deadline. There was nothing there. Then I called Pierce County Crisis uh, Line, 1-800-576-7764. None of these numbers are particularly easy to remember. The first question they asked you was, what's your name? Uh, and then uh, the call was taken in, um, they don't ask what your problem is, they just want to know who you are. I suppose if you're making the call, you're worried that they're tying up your name with the phone number that you've just used. It's a privacy issue, and it, it turns people off. Uh, the call was taken in Seattle, not Tacoma. Then they refer you to the Washington Recovery Helpline, so I called that line. And uh, I said, you know, I said, are you in Washington? Yes, Washington, D.C. So here we are. They want to know how old you are. The very first thing, how old are you? What kind of insurance do you have? Um, bottom line is, every time I've tried this, and sometimes I do it with my staff in my office, just so we can all see what's happening when you try to get help, I know that it's very difficult to do that. Um, and I wanted you to know that I... I um, I do think these people on the streets sometimes, they only surface every so often. And when they do, when they know that if they don't get help, they're going to die, they need a place to go quickly. Two most important things, I think, from this takeaway, maybe this, that 211 would welcome this, and it's inexpensive. Those are two things. Bottom line, I suppose, is it's extremely needed. Uh, COVID will hopefully... Um, Somehow we'll find a virus or something will happen. I don't know that we'll have it forever, but we will have drug abuse forever, and we do need to uh, to address it. I hope you'll consider passing this on as a recommended. Any, any more questions at this time? I do not see any hands raised, no. Okay. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, Thank you very much, Council Member Roach. We really appreciate um, the presentation. Very interesting and obviously and a very important topic. And we appreciate you uh, taking the time today to meet with us. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Bye-bye mm -hmm. now. Bye. Okay, uh, so moving on to the next item on our agenda. We're going to have an overview of the Interoperable Video Calling Working Group's report and recommendations on implementation of the database approach for interoperable video calling. Presenting for the group are the co-chairs, David Bahar and Chris Wendt. Uh, co-chairs, the call is now yours. Hi, this is Chris Wendt. Uh, David, are you online? Yep, I'm here. This is David Bahar. Okay. Do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, so first of all, hello and good morning to everyone. Uh, I am, as was said, David Bahar. I am the Director of Telecommunications of Maryland, also co-chair of the IBC Working Group with Chris Wendt. Um, I wanted to first take a moment to thank the Nancy for giving us the opportunity to investigate this issue uh, and to create these recommendations. We do think that the recommendations we're presenting today um, are really a, a wonderful encapsulation of all of the work that has been done by different members of our working group, incorporating all their various viewpoints and needs into a single proposal that I think will work for everyone. Uh, the IVC working group uh, was initially established by the Nancy two years ago uh, for the purposes of exploring how to make interoperable 10-digit number-based video calling possible. 
And uh, interoperability of video calling could help to enhance video calling not only for hearing people who communicate over the traditional telephone network, for, for, but for also people who have hearing or speech disabilities uh, and currently experience uh, a variety of different incompatible uh, services and equipment that are out there in the marketplace. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Chris if you want to talk a little bit about the charge. Sure. Um, should we advance the slides? Uh, didn't want to forget about uh, listing all the members. Uh, um, we had a great group of uh, members for this session, uh, some that continued, some that are new. Um, and um, you know, a, a number of people from various different backgrounds and uh, expertise. Um, so really, uh, I think uh, uh, it was very uh, um, great conversation between uh, uh, folks of different backgrounds and representing different uh, areas. Uh, next page. So um, David talked a little bit about the mission here, and uh, I think people are familiar with it, so I don't think we need to spend too much time here. Um, why don't we go to the charge itself? Um, so one correction here, uh, sort of copy and paste there. We, we actually have met, I think I counted about 20 times um, between February 20th and uh, June, the end of June. Um, interestingly, um, we most meetings went the full uh, time period. We had generally very engaged conversation, and uh, um, it really was, uh, I think, a great experience uh, uh, this time with a lot of input uh, from uh, um, um, a lot of the members of the working group. Um, so I really want to thank all the members that made contributions um, um, and, uh, and uh, really uh, brought together, together what, I, what I think is a, a very comprehensive um, proposal, uh, as we'll discuss. Um, so again, I'm not going to read through the questions because they'll be addressed on the next few slides. Uh, David, did you want to add anything to that, or should we go into the recommendations? Uh, yeah, I think we can proceed to the recommendations. Great. Okay, so um, the first uh, question uh, had to do with uh, what was ex essentially an extension of the last session of the IBC, which was consider uh, using existing one or more of the existing numbering databases or establish a new database. And we talked a, a little bit about this at the conclusion of our last working session, um, where uh, we said that uh, um, the database approach uh, versus the platform approach, which sort of foreshadowed the conclusion here. Uh, the platform approach was thinking about how can we do video calling through existing, um, you know, telephone-like mechanisms um, versus uh, establishing a new uh, paradigm for, uh, for video calling specifically. So as part of this effort, we spoke specifically, and some of the feedback we got also from the, the progress report uh, um, a few months back, uh, we specifically spoke to the NAPAM LLC, who is the, um, as you know, Tim and Teresa, they, uh, Tim did a presentation earlier uh, that manages the NPAC and uh, asked about both the uh, some of the technical aspects and uh, also importantly, the economic aspects of uh, use of the NPAC. Um, and for, for ITRS, we actually had many of the key subject matter experts um, within the working group. Um, so we felt we were pretty covered there. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, the working group um, recommended following the established establish a new database path. And that really has to do with the fact that um, uh, video calling, as we all know, that's a huge, um, especially in these days, a huge focus. Um, most of the approaches for routing video calls um, in terms of the, the sending the technical bits over the uh, network um, work a lot differently than the, the telephone network. Um, and we wanted to make sure, and, and, and additionally, there's um, you know, a lot of new players uh, or, or non-traditional telecom players that are um, um, providing those services. So for a lot of those reasons, we thought a more greenfield approach uh, would be beneficial um, to make sure that we're not, you know, uh, we don't have any boat anchors in terms of uh, uh, how we do telephone calls today, and that you also didn't have some, um, you know, odd situations where um, either from a technology point of view or a funding point of view, there's, uh, uh, it's not, it wouldn't be clear who is funding what. So, you know, pretty much the message you'll hear today and most of our recommendations is this new approach. Um, we talked about different database technologies. So uh, we'd like to uh, recommend that uh, the use of investigating distributed database technologies um, for uh, uh, a economically um, fair way of uh, distributing uh, all of the database records, as well as an interesting way and a more advantageous way to make sure that uh, all of the registry data is distributed and localized to each of the IBC providers that provide um, services. And so therefore they have very efficient access to the data that is updated in real time. Um, it wasn't a focus of this session, but we obviously know, knew that there's going to have to be some effort for uh, standards efforts around IP-based video calling signaling. Um, there's both coverage of one-to-one -one calling uh, as well as potentially video conferencing um, and, you know, one of the major use cases obviously is uh, relay of video um, for uh, deaf and hearing impaired. Uh, and um, there's potential for standardization of uh, new database uh, and other protocols that are dependent on those database. And a big component obviously is uh, making sure that uh, these things are secure. So making sure that uh, digital signatures and other cryptographic standards um, are investigated for use of uh, validating both that the participants who are authorized to, uh, to write to the database or read from the database um, are appropriately uh, secured. Next page. So the next question, 1B, uh, uh, is about uh, the performance and security measures, uh, some things I already discussed. Um, so we actually did go through, and, and if you read the report, there's a lot of uh, detailed requirements and uh, uh, discussion on what characteristics the database needs to have for both performance and security. I overviewed a little bit, you know, the data, distributed database provides unique characteristics for having local copies of uh, the database uh, that are updated uh, uh, very efficiently. Um, we also provided uh, pretty detailed specific requirements for um, the provisioning of both te telephone numbers and toll-free numbers. Um, and 
talked about the authority uh, that would be associated with the ability to do that provisioning, as well as some of the specifics around what read and write access characteristics would be required um, as part of the recommendation. And then um, additionally, and this uh, was really a lot of great work went into this, um, part of the, it's I think in the last section of the document, uh, we have a, a large number of baseline IBC use cases and high level call flows so that uh, um, it, and it really gave a great basis for making sure that our database recommendations uh, could uh, could uh, be appropriate for um, the work that's going to need to happen going forward. Um, but also, you know, it gives us a great head start in terms of the requirements for future sessions that probably will, um, you know, need to deal with some of the things uh, around the video call signaling and media handling and other um, parts uh, of uh, the network to extend, um, you know, and, and, and really be part of the implementation of the, the video calls themselves. Uh, next page. Uh, question 1C, uh, how should the database be funded? Um, this one, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time um, discussing this, uh, but it sort of seemed uh, a little bit of an obvious choice here to try to adopt what we've seen uh, be a very successful model so far um, uh, as part of the Nancy Cattle Working Group recommendation for the governance of the Stir Shaken uh, Trust Anchor. Um, so in that world, there's a STIGA, um, as Brent had reported earlier today, and STIPA. Um, we recommend um, and define the concept of an IBC GA and IBC PA um, with a very similar model. Um, and we even discussed, you know, would it make sense? Is there any overlap with existing STI GA and PA? Um, but it was pretty clear that, you know, because uh, the participants in this, uh, in the IBC ecosystem would be very different. Um, um, and uh, we wanted to make sure there's very clear separation of, uh, you know, legal and financial funding um, that there should be a separate and distinct. But certainly uh, we feel like there's a lot of advantage um, to maintaining a similar model and hopefully that should help to, uh, you know, when the industry is ready to establish these, uh, hopefully the, the experience we've had and the or shake an ecosystem can apply to the IBC world. Um, uh, we provide some details, again, some lesson learned and some other recommendations uh, for the establishment of the governance uh, and the economic considerations. In particular, you know, sort of some of the, how, how you set up the, uh, you know, the, the organization of the, of the governance and, 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 and specific recommendations like that. Um, and just to note, uh, we did not provide any specific recommendations for VRS and, you know, specifically how the ITRS directory uh, and VRS providers can participate in the IBC ecosystem. We thought that um, is something that the you know, that because it's governed by the FCC, that should be something that should be considered there. Um, um, just, you know, to explain that further, um, because you might have uh, VRS providers that are also part of the general IBC ecosystem providing general IBC calls. So the question there is, you know, how, how would costs be split across those two different, two different business models? Okay, next page. Yeah, this is okay, David. 
Um, and I, I, I can take this one, Chris, if you don't mind. Yeah, go go for it. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd like to add in a little bit more also to what Chris was uh, saying a bit earlier, um, because it's relevant to this, uh, this next slide. Um, question number two is what we're looking at now to evaluate the technical and operational feasibility of interoperating with TRS. Um, so TRS is funded through uh, the TRS fund. Um, as everyone here is aware. And so uh, when a TRS or VRS provider will want to participate in the IVC ecosystem, the FTC would have to make a decision to either uh, have the VRS provider take responsibility themselves in terms of paying for the associated cost of establishing their independent copy of the distributed database, um, which also contributes to operation on uh, governance and administration, uh, or whether the TRS fund would cover those expenses. Uh, it, it, there's a couple of, those are just two of the ways that uh, that could be done, um, but there's a number of different ways and different configurations how that might exist. We couldn't make some determination about how to move forward on that because that's outside of the scope of our discussion and our charge from the commission. Um, so the direct response to question two, um, again, evaluate the technical and operational feasibility of interoperating with TRS. Uh, in order to allow for direct connections to PSAPs in particular, um, we started our conversations on this way back in February, um, and we were looking at this from a very, very high level. Uh, and trying to determine the best system to support uh, both performance, security, to allow for an equal uh, distribution of uh, authority and responsibility for handling and administering these calls. Uh, and this question has been in our mind throughout. Um, would this work in 911 context with Relay or without Relay? Would this, uh, whatever solution we were looking at, we constantly applied that 911 lens to it. It's a very important part of IVC, in my opinion, particularly uh, as a member of the deaf and hard of hearing community. And I can tell you a little bit about why that's true. Uh, the way the telephone system has historically functioned is completely reliant, of course, on audio. Uh, and deaf and hard of hearing people are not able to participate there, or at least were not until the advent of telecommunications relay service, uh, and we got access to that network. However, uh, in order to call, call 911, there was a requirement in the ADA that all the 911 centers use uh, a TTY and that allow for us to direct call. So people who can't otherwise hear the phone can use the TTY to call 911. It's not really an equivalent experience to what people are getting. If you're using Relay or using a TTY, you've got more delay, um, but uh, it is something, although it's certainly preferred for the deaf or hard of hearing person to be able to connect directly to 911. Um, and TTY was the first time that you would do that, right, um, using the phone to have that direct connection to 911. Um, and it felt sort of like a hundred year bolt on, right? We've got this telephone system that was uh, initially set up and it took <laughs> almost a hundred years, I think maybe even a, more than a hundred years before the advent of the TTY was introduced and then before that was required in PSAPs. So now we have an opportunity to re-envision this same concept in an IP telecom world through video and how deaf and hard of hearing people who historically have been frustrated with their level of access to the telephone network are going to be able to participate on more even terms, uh, including um, recovering and getting back that ability to direct connect to 911, which we got through TTY, which is an archaic uh, means of communication. The reason I say get that back is that although TTY uh, access to 911 was required in the ADA, TTY mm -hmm. use has continued to decline. It's a much less favored technology as compared with video technologies of today. So it's far less prevalent. 
Uh, and video technologies today uh, are something that now 911 centers are looking to support through NG911. Uh, so that two-way video capability and establishing a direct video connection to 911 simply by dialing 911 over your video-enabled phone uh, is something that would be made possible by our recommendation. Uh, not just for individuals who are using video relay service or uh, relay services. I don't want to, to foster that misconception, but um, people who today call 911, 911 um, Currently, technically, some, in some cases, supports text, of course, or supports voice, and there are some cases where um, they would support video. We are able to make video calls, quote unquote, to 911 today through VRS by connecting over video to our VRS interpreter. But this experience of direct video connection to 911 will be expanded to everyone. Um, so, as far as um, legal requirements, for 911 supporting certain technologies and what have you. Uh, the TTY requirement has been in place for a number of years. In this case, what we're looking at doing is creating some of the building blocks for video-based direct 911 calling. And we're going to avoid getting into the intricacies of what is legally required or not. But I think that putting together the building blocks here and establishing a directory upon which you would be able to build a framework um, for certain requirements of technologies at a later point, right? Under a different process, perhaps in a different agency with different jurisdiction, et cetera, that would be necessary. Uh, I can move to the next slide, please. And uh, I think, Chris, uh, if you want to take this first uh, chunk of this question, I'll take the last half. Sure. So, uh, you know, just to uh, uh, start to wrap up, uh, the, you know, the, both David and I, um, again, uh, really appreciate the working group's participation, um, you know, uh, uh, the output of the last IBC, we weren't totally clear on the direction, but I think over the course of this and some reflection back on the discussions, uh, I think we really did have uh, get from the very beginning of the working group uh, a pretty clear direction. Um, it was great to see, um, you know, near unanimous agreement. Um, I just want to to say, you know, there wasn't completely unanimous agreement on all aspects, um, but, you know, we, you know, part of the reason for that is there is a ton of complexity here and um, so many technologies involved and, you know, obviously policies and economics uh, that we have to uh, incorporate as well. Um, so, you know, from and and there uh, uh, um, we had a lot of ground to cover, um, even though the scope of our uh, working group was mainly around uh, just uh, the database requirements. But as we know, that can be a, a, a fairly complex thing. It's where all all of the providers come together in a single place. And so it is sort of a key part of what we're doing. Um, um, you know, um, we also wanted to make sure that, you know, there uh, was work that, uh, uh, that, that the work we were doing was uh, complemented the way uh, how the telephone operates. We didn't want to um, um, impose something or be, like I said before, have a little, have, have somewhat of a boat anchor because of some of the policies and technology choices that have, that have been made in the past. And we want to make sure that IBC is successful going forward. So that was some of the, uh, a lot of where um, most of the di discussion points uh, were raised um, and uh, uh, spent a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, David, you want to take the last section? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, the recommendations that the working group developed, uh, we believe, 
provides the strongest possible foundation for an IBC ecosystem uh, as compared with other potential options, which we explored over the course of our many, many hours of many, many meetings. Uh, and this solution that we have recommended is the one that we found to work for everyone, uh, whether it be industry partners, uh, consumer groups and representatives, people with disabilities, people who are deaf and hard of hearing, VRS video relay service providers, um, everyone who is represented at our working group. Um, and in support of all of our discussions, contributing their thoughts, everyone worked to put together language for our recommendation, and we feel like it reflects a very workable uh, foundation here. Uh, in terms of the governance and administration model uh, with the IBCGA, which would be funded by those various participants in the IBC ecosystem, uh, and not necessarily uh, blended into the administration of the overall audio only traditional telephone network that does not have a capacity for video. Um, you know, we feel like that easily allows for companies to understand the distinction and the way that they can move forward with participating in that ecosystem and simplifies that as much as possible. We also uh, made sure that the system remains flexible. Um, and rather than being uh, rigid and unable to accommodate new innovations and new technologies, one of the key aspects of the recommendations that we uh, generate in terms of requirements for our database, um, that the new distributed database model should be extensible uh, so that over time, as new uh, fields are needed, new technologies arise that we can continue to amend that database and append that database in order to keep it relevant. Uh, and so that all the parties that need to use it will still see a benefit. I also want to reinforce something that Chris said earlier. Um, today's telephone network uh, we, we're not interested in finding yet another bolt on to the existing telephone network uh, and limiting ourselves uh, by one of these older established systems, but instead establishing a system that can work in parallel and complement the existing telephone network, but operate independently. And uh, I feel like every one of the members of our working group was on board that this would be the ideal approach to achieve that. Um, and before I wrap it up and turn it back to Chris for us to uh, have uh, any Chris's closing remarks and to move on to questions, I also want to recognize the time and commitment of all of the members of our working group. Um, we are all very proud of the recommendation that we've generated. So I want to also thank my co-chair, Chris Wendt, um, for all of your time, Chris, that you spent all of your attention to detail in this work and your support throughout. Um, I appreciate having the opportunity to work on this important issue and this working group. And now I'll turn it back to Chris for any final thoughts. Sure. I, I also want to echo uh, my appreciation for uh, having the opportunity to work on this. Uh, like I said, it was uh, uh, a lot of great discussion. I think we've made a lot of progress. Uh, um, and I also want to thank David for uh, being my co-chair um, um, who, who uh, was uh, um, uh, key for uh, bringing everybody together and uh, um, making sure that uh, I could focus on some of the more technical parts of the discussions. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, and also to the rest of the working group, uh, um, I've said it before, but uh, I think it was a, a really great uh, a group of folks uh, and we really worked well together. So appreciate it um, and I'll turn it over for questions. Thanks, David and Chris. Rick Sharkey from SIPFORM has a couple of questions. Rick? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, I do want to congratulate the members of the IBC Working Group. I mean, this is a great deal of work that you folks have you know, put together over an extended period of time. And uh, 
This is something, by the way, that the Forum uh, tried to work on, frankly, unsuccessfully, when Henning Schultz was chief technology officer as well. So we gave a stab at that in terms of trying to come up with an interoperable SIP profile, but getting adoption was, shall we say, problematic at best. To my real point here, and Chris Wen, I think, knows this uh, very, very well. We've privately talked about this. I have severe reservations about a proposal for a brand new database. The the problems that the FCC has brought to the NANCY always seems to revolve around, oh, well, we'll just put a new database out there if it's going to be we assign numbers, we'll do this, do a call, here's another database here, et cetera, et cetera, which is creating a complexity in the overall network that is going to be very, very challenging for our service providers to implement. And uh, we are the next presentation will actually make that even more complex because the problem of telephone number to URI translations is not just a particular issue in terms of IVC. We were struggling with this in the National Number Portability Working Group about what database do you actually put these uh, translation elements in. And in addition, there's uh, the larger looming issue of the technology transitions and all IP interconnection, which is, again, one more kind of telephone number to URI translation. And the position that I've personally taken is that um, either the NANCY or the Commission itself needs to reopen the technology transitions docket uh, to be refreshed because we need to take a more, shall we say, holistic view of how we're doing these things before we get into a proliferation. The complexity of the network becomes untenable because of the various TN to URI lookups that may have to be performed by any one particular network element. And, the, uh, and again, you folks have done a wonderful job, however. The, the Just saying you're going to have a distributed database does not necessarily address what it will actually take to define the protocols of a distributed database architecture. So, Chris, I, I, I've got to ask you, uh, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about a model based on on the white space? databases. Uh, hopefully you're not considering um, something like Hyperledger or something like that, but I, I just want to let the members of the ANC know the problem that you've got here is to get the engineering community in a room to agree on a tactical basis for a new distributed database technology. However wonderful it might be, you're looking at a five-year effort. And, um, I mean, that's the minimum that it took for those of us to do Star Shaken. And I can't see a new distributed database registry for phone numbers to take any less than that. So I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that. Um, I I think, you know, the the, the scope that we're – thinking about, um, and we detail some of this in the report, uh, is that um, distributed database technologies um, exist and are very much available in, uh, and in commercial solutions in uh, uh, various forms of databases. Um, it's a, a very well-solved problem at this point. Um, so that's sort of just like the fundamental thing. I think this database, it's important to recognize, is not necessarily um, just a routing database. Um, that's 
part of it, but, uh, you know, one important thing to recognize in the flow that we have is that it's a telephone number association database. So, you know, we, we, we sort of see that customers, you know, will have existing telephone numbers that in the telephone network that they will associate um, into the IBC world. They will prove to the IBC provider um, in mechanisms that we uh, hope will be defined uh, in, you know, uh, upcoming standards and other efforts. Um, and a, an associated provider, it may be that, you know, IBC providers, uh, you, you may switch, you know, it, it may happen to be that you switch IBC providers more often than you do porting numbers, you know, like, in fact, you know, I would suspect that people are going to keep their numbers uh, and not port their numbers uh, as much. Uh, uh, well, maybe that's not a good parallel to make, but, but anyways, like uh, your association with uh, uh, IBC providers uh, may change fairly often depending what features and functionality you're looking for, um, but that consistency is there. And then in the database itself, um, it's imagined that similar to Stir Shaken, there would be, uh, you know, cryptographic signing materials associated with both the provider um, and the telephone number and customer uh, that you're associating the IBC provider that can sign the records within the database as a way of an authoritative check on making sure that the appropriate authoritative um, uh, uh, actor has, uh, you know, signed the record, signed the fact that you know, that this is the destination where a call should be sent for a, for a particular IVC participant. Look, um, Chris, I totally, absolutely agree with that one way or the other. Let me just ask one more question because I'm sure maybe somebody else has uh, some additional questions as well. In terms of the actual standardization of a distributed database, where would you anticipate that work being done? Um, well, we say at the end of the report that, you know, we sort of see the similar model that we've done stir shaken where, you know, uh, international standards like IETF, bodies like IETF and, you know, then you know, in terms of North America, uh, or the U.S., uh, you know, um, groups like IPNNI, um, maybe a separate one, uh, might be relevant as well. Um, but I well, think I, we want to make And let me agree with you that, that given the fact that we're probably going to end up be somewhat North American-centric with our Canadian friends, if you're, if you're thinking about a standardization model that looks like the ADISIP Forum NNI Task Force, I could easily, I mean, I would absolutely agree with that. I think that's probably the most logical thing since, you know, IETF in particular, it doesn't do databases. That's that's for sure. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I, I'll leave uh, yeah. it at that. Yeah. Right. I, I would agree. I think there's plenty of choices for di distributed database uh, protocols and technologies right. or that already exists. We don't need to standardize that, but I'm thinking more on the signaling part and securing of the 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 signaling in the media and uh, you know and how that will actually work and, because right and the policy know. and governance issues and stuff like that and clearly yeah. the SCIGA uh, uh, has done a wonderful job in putting all of those complex efforts together and Brent Struthers has done a wonderful job along those lines, you know, doing that industry, um, you know, specific kind of, of thing along those lines with, with a large stakeholder group, uh, in a multi-stakeholder consensus driven process, um, clearly would be something that I could certainly, you know, get the SIP forum behind and I'm sure the fine folks at Addis would, uh, 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 be amenable to that as well. So I'll turn. Uh, I'll, I'll let somebody else, you know, speak. This is David Bohar. Um, 
I'd Hi, like Dave. To chime in with a with a comment <laughs> as well. I'm surprised. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wanted to uh, just respond quickly with a few of my own thoughts as well. Um, so the database itself, we really spent a lot of time in the group discussing whether we should make use of an existing system, make modifications as necessary to how the existing system works, or whether it would be best to look at a new database. We, we really looked carefully at and studied that question. Uh, in terms of implementing a new database, there's a lot of benefits to be realized there. Um, utilizing gossip protocol, we feel like the distributed database model provides a lot more robustness um, and provides a really strong foundation for an eventual IBC ecosystem. I feel, uh, and I, I believe that many of our other members uh, feel like implementing that is far less complicated then trying to figure out a way to work this into an existing database, for example, the number portability database or what have you. And the I, simple I, I don't solution, dis, I, don't I think, dis, is what we discussed to implement I, a, a new right. database, and that's what we wrote. I, I don't, you had mentioned the protocols in particular. Um, and although we, we do mention specifically gossip protocol there um, is called out in our recommendation as uh, the distributed database uh, protocol that we talk about using, but we also wanted to emphasize that the governance authority uh, is something that would have to come before the database and that the governance authority, uh, it, which would have to be made up, of course, of industry members who would be participants in the IVC ecosystem, uh, that GA would be the entity that would have to make some key decisions in terms of how to implement the exact details of the technology that is behind standing up this type of distributed database. And you know, there's, in terms of gossip protocol, there's a number of different factors to that that, that um, we're certainly aware of. And there are a few other different protocols that can be chosen from, of course, to implement, although we call out gossip in particular. But we did come to a, a consensus-driven uh, process here, and I think that that would be uh, something similar that the GA would have to end up before, doing before they got to implementation. Um, I, I'm thinking about the earlier implementations of the POTS, right? Your plain old telephone system. Um, interoperability uh, was a fairy tale when this was first uh, uh, invented. And then we had to take some steps and go through some work in order to get to a point where you're getting interoperable. And I think that we're at a similar I, 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 inflection believe, point with video. I, so I, I do I've think been that approach with, is going to give us the best, the best opportunity for this thing to get legs and run on its own. I've been involved with, uh, I'm, I'm the chair of the SIF forum after all, and, and these particular interoperable issues and stuff like that, I've been dealing with, with 20 for 20 years or more especially the TN to URI associations to a certain extent. I mean, I was involved almost at the inception of the NPAC itself, and some of you know that I was you know, the chair of the ITF working group for RFC 6116, which is the ENUM protocols, and you know, uh, which is actually how ITRS operates even today. It, it, that is ENUM. Uh, and I don't necessarily disagree that given modern technologies now, some other kind of distributed database would be useful, except the I, I would disagree that you need the governance authority before you need a technical recommendation on the structure of a uh, distributed database. I think either they have, you know, I'm, I'm just the poor engineer like, Chris went, you're going to have to have industry consensus on what the database looks like even before you do the government's model because the data, how the database is structured actually will drive in large measure how the governance authority would work. I mean, that's just my own you know, sort of personal opinion about that. So, again, congratulations on a, on a fine and comprehensive report, but uh, we shall see.
Thank you, Richard. Uh, okay. I don't see any other hands raised, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. If our discussion has concluded, um, I'm going to open the meeting for a motion to approve the interoperable video calling working group report and recommendations. Do we have anyone who would like to make a motion to approve? Chairman McKay, move to approve the report. Sorry, we had a we had a couple people there uh, eager to approve. I'm sorry, it was, was. Could you say your name again? I'm sorry, Julie. I think I uh, talked over you, but this was Tim Cagle from Comcast. We okay. would move to approve the report. Okay, thank you, Tim. And um, this is Rich Shockey. I second the motion to approve the report. Okay, thank you, Rich. Um, with that second, we'll submit it to the council for a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, do we have any names? Okay, then we have it. Uh, the Nancy approves the report and recommendations. Um, thank you, everyone. A special thanks to everyone in the IVC working group um, who worked so hard on this and the leadership. Uh, we really appreciate it. Now, um, the agenda calls for a lunch break. I think, given our extended break before our earlier presentation, um, I guess what I would like to press on if we could. Um, it's Bridget. Uh, Alexander White and Phil Lindsay, are you here ready to do the, your um, NMP re report? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, oh, great. Um, then we'll have an overview of the nationwide number portability working groups report and recommendation. And presenting for the group are the co chairs, Bridget Alexander White and Phil Lindsay, um, and the call is yours. Thank you, Chair McKee. Good almost afternoon, everyone. This is Bridget Alexander White with US Connect, and I'm one of the co chairs of the NMP Working Group along with Phil Lindsay at CenturyLink. So, before we begin, I would like to first of all thank my co chair, Phil Lindsay, for his assistance with serving as a co chair and for his invaluable knowledge, which I continue to appreciate. So, thank you, Phil. I would like to thank all the members of the NMP Working Group for the long hours and long meetings of work on the report is very much appreciated. And I think that the report we have presented to the Nancy for review is a very good detailed report. We completed our report in June and submitted it all to you for review. And therefore, I will not bore you all and read all of the slides to you. If I could have the person changing the slides, please start with the directives is where I would like to start so that we can get into the heart of our report. So we were tasked with roughly four directives as part of the working group. And the first one is to analyze the likely effects of the IPLRN solution, including interconnection, carrier expenses related to database dip, dip costs, and to transport costs, consumer expectations regarding toll charges, and state and federal tariffs for retail and wholesale services. Next slide, please. So the responses to our first directive was we believe that carrier expenses related to database queries and transport costs will vary greatly based on the type of service provider. And given that non-IT service providers will greatly be impacted in both costs and the level of changes required to support NNP, those providers with legacy TDM networks will incur, we believe, the highest cost to support IT LRN as the NNP solution due to the need to update networks, internal software systems, and entering into potential commercial arrangements or agreements with an IP provider to transport those NNP calls. And service providers that offer long distance calling services at a cost may need to educate their customers on the change to their service offerings. In addition, some service providers may like not to offer NMP, which still makes which may cause some confusion because of course those customers that don't understand why one provider offers it and theirs is not, there has to be an education process there. And then applicable tariffs would be impacted by any NMP solution implemented and may need to be revised or redefined. Next slide, please. 
Directive number two was to recommend a path forward to implement the IPLRN solution, including providing recommendations as to the series of steps, the estimated time each step would take in implementing the solution, and the extent to which commercial solutions can serve as a substitute for the IPLRN solution for small carriers, including the cost of those solutions. Next slide, please. Our response, the working group's response to those questions was that we recommend that the impacts on access charges be further investigated for the NNP alternative. The impact each service provider to implement the solution will vary based upon the type of service provider and the age of their network elements and internal systems, as well as upgraded billing systems and numbering software potentially. The timeline, of course, must allow for various changes required by different service providers. Everyone's not going to be able to likely change or upgrade their network at the same time or in the same process. And then we believe the FCC should seek comment on the impacts and costs identified in this report in implementing an IPLRN solution to support NNP. Next slide, please. The third directive was whether the IPLRN solution should be modified in light of any developments since the report was issued and the conclusions reached with regard to number one. Next slide, please. The NNP working group carried forward a lot of assumptions from previous NNP working group efforts. If you read through the report, you'll see we had a list of assumptions in the document. And the group determined it is unlikely that the IPL model would need to be modified or reconsidered unless those assumptions change or policy decisions are made regarding traffic jurisdiction, intercarrier compensation, poly location, and interconnection requirements. Next slide, please. And directive number four, how to address the objections and concerns raised in the minority report that accompany the previous report, NNP report, I should say. Next slide, please. And the working group determined that the issues identified in the minority report respond to the NNP technical subcommittee report that must be addressed by the commission are inter intercarrier compensation, IP interconnection, and industry routing database accommodations to support those interim and long-term solutions. The working group also concluded that into any interim regulatory focus should concentrate on the dependencies that would place the technological options on equal footing, including encouraging the existing commercial agreement alternative discussed in previous reports. Next slide, please. So that concludes our response to the directive. The next slide, you will see you have the Nancy NMP working group members and our FCC liaison to Jesse and Janice, I apologize for not thanking you all in the beginning because your assistance was invaluable as well. So thank you both for joining and assisting us when needed. Next slide, please. And our Nancy NNP working group members, this is a full list of our voting members and non-voting members. And again, I thank you all for the time and effort that you put into helping finalize the report for the full Nancy review. I believe that's our last slide. Yeah, and this is this is Phil Lindsay with uh, CenturyLink, um, Bridget's co-chair, and I wanted to thank Bridget as well. She was a tremendous kind of a lead of our co-chairs. Um, so I just uh, want to uh, do a shout out to her for her, her extraordinary efforts on this as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. I appreciate that a great deal. Thanks, Bridget mm -hmm. and Phil. Uh, I have a couple of hands up. Mm -hmm. First is Tim Cagle, then Richard Shockey, then uh, Sarah from Telnex. Tim? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. This is Tim Cagle with Comcast. I just want to first say and commend the work of this particular body for their report. Uh, after reviewing it, there is a lot of good and useful use cases that are captured in the matrix that is uh, embodied in the report. And I think that uh, will be beneficial for the industry as we consider this question. What's not clear to me in the working group's report, however, is 
whether or not um, the, this particular IPLRN solution can move forward. So I've seen a lot of good discussion in the report that suggests there are certain impacts, most specifically to TDM-based carriers, potentially around cost, consumer education, but from a, you know, looking at it from a non-engineering perspective, from a consumer benefit perspective, it would seem that NMP would hold great promise for American consumers to be able to keep their telephone numbers regardless of geographic rate center uh, locations. Very similarly to the way wireless providers allow it uh, end users to keep their telephone numbers. So perhaps you could just clarify for us that the report's recommendation draws a conclusion that the solution can move forward with commercial agreements. Uh, the solution cannot move forward because of specific issues. If, if you could help me understand that better, um, I would certainly appreciate that. And thanks again for the work of this group. And and this is Phil. I I can probably touch on that a little bit. Um, you know the the charge letter was around the IPLRN solution, and I think there are still and I think as the report kind of expresses, there are still some outstanding issues that are in the process of being addressed which could impact this. And I think that's where this, um, this report kind of comes out is there are still those items like intercare comp, IP interconnection, uh, those kinds of items that could impact how this um, could get rolled out or could impact providers. Um, one of the main ident uh, aspects of this is, um, you know, how to make all providers whole in um, implementing a nationwide number portability. And it's not necessarily specific to this solution, but the overall concept of nationwide number portability, um, because you're looking at um, modifying the, the expectation of what um, service providers are, um, uh, their cost um, you know, uh, models around how they do business completely changes when you look at a nationwide number portability model. But that wasn't necessarily really the, the part of the charge letter. And we explicitly stayed away from uh, addressing other alternatives um, based on the input of the overall working group. We avoided really any kind of comparison or conclusions that involved anything other than the IPLRN um, proposal that was given to us by through the charge letter. And a quick response on the commercial agreement side of that question that we did in the report in the doc in the slide that state that we're encouraging the existing commercial agreements alternative will be considered. Yeah, absolutely. This is still again and you know with that, I mean there's there's really nothing out there that prohibits that a commercial arrangement that I'm aware of. Um, and so, I mean, that's almost like kind of an underlying assumption there is that providers and the industry could still uh, rely upon commercial agreements to, to move forward with this. Phil, does that, I'm sorry, Tim, does that answer your question? Well, it, it does, I think, sort of, Bridget. I mean, I think commercial agreements are one alternative. Um, I, I guess if I'm understanding this correctly, the long pole in the tent here is really the TDM-based network providers or those providers that may have a mixture of technologies in their network. And until those TDM-based providers upgrade their networks, 
um, this concern is going to continually bubble up. So I think Mr. Shockey addressed this in the uh, stated this in the IVC's working group's report, but perhaps it may be time for the FCC to look at ref, uh, the need to refresh the network technology question. Um, I guess what I you know what I'm trying to get a clear sense of here is for those service providers that wish to offer an NNP product to their consumers, can we move forward? This, in my opinion, is not about whether other providers are on the same footing. It is more about for those uh, service providers that wish to offer this as a product, uh, can we do so? And are there technical ramifications to those um, network providers who do not offer this product, will we be able to complete calls? Those sorts of questions. That's what I'm looking for out of this particular recommendation. Well, and and this is Phil, and I, you know, I think the presumption that the long pole in the tent is the TDM networks. I don't think that's necessarily accurate because there are plenty of uh, providers out there that have IP networks that have um, um, concern around uh, the potential increased costs uh, without uh, the benefit of any kind of, basically what you're talking about is maybe potentially a small uh, provider uh, customer ports out and moves across the country who pays for the transport for those local calls or those calls that originate from their former neighbors to get to that now distant customer. That's irregardless of whether that, that network was a TDM network or an IP network. So, and those are all involved in what you said is, you know, the technology transition as well as intercarrier compensation and how those costs are going to be allocated, uh, you know, to those providers. So those are kind of the outstanding questions that still need to be resolved that the working group cannot resolve. Those are policy questions. No, thank you for that clarification, Phil. Uh, I appreciate it. So, you know, again, I, I don't want to belabor the point. I'll turn it over to Marilyn and let other folks who may be um, interested in asking questions about the working group's report, um, ask their questions. So thank you again to the working group. Very comprehensive report and appreciate all the work that went into this. Thank you, Sam. Pam. Uh, Richard Shocker, you were next. Get forward. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank Tim Cagle because I think he asked, uh, I do want to thank Tim Cagle uh, specifically for asking some of the highly relevant questions that some of us have been struggling with and I think will continue to struggle with. As I mentioned in my uh, remarks on video calling, uh, the, the issues that Phil was talking about are fundamentally policy issues, whether it be technology transitions or the transition of the existing phone network into an all IP world or specifically intercarrier compensation um, as it involves originating access charges. Um, we just don't have good answers about that. And those are questions that are sort of beyond our pay grade to be quite honest here. The other thing that I do wanna emphasize to my fellow members of the Nancy is, there are really two proposals on the table, okay? As the co-chair of the original NNP working group, we looked at both IP LRNs and national LRNs as potential viable alternatives. And the issue I had with the original charge letter was it, it, is, it made a, a vague assumption that IPLRNs was the only solution that, that the 
Wireline Competition Bureau and the Commission would consider, when in fact I do not believe that is the case. The, the ultimate decision here is between an IP LRN solution and a national LRN solution that we developed in our original report. And, you know, I do want to thank everybody at the NMP Working Group. You know, I've done this before, so I know how difficult and challenging it is, but I just want to emphasize there are really still two proposals on the table. But Marilyn, and, back and to you. Rich. Oh. Yeah, Rich, this is Phil Lindsay, if I may, or just uh, respond to that. And there is that third, which I think even Tim pointed out, which is that commercial agreement, which basically exists out there today. Uh, it can be addressed. Point. I, 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 right. And I apologize for not having I know you said that. Mean, yeah. yeah, I didn't mean yeah, it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's the other alternative out there. But um, I certainly always believe that NL, the NLRN solution, was in fact the optimal one, uh, but again, you know, as I mentioned with VRS, there's a lot of tactical as well as policy issues that need to be resolved. You know, on the what was once the eighth floor um, before we can actually even consider deploying any of these solutions. Marilyn, back to you. Thank you for those comments, Rich. We appreciate them. Next, uh, we will hear from Sarah from Telnex. Sarah? Hi. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have to apologize. David did have to jump off, um, so I'll just be sharing a few thoughts here. Um, Telnex first just wanted to thank the entire committee um, for their hard work in putting together this report. I think the group had sometimes difficult conversations, um, but generally I think we produced a really sound report that provides further details on the IPLRN mechanism, which is great. Um, and we especially just wanted to, to shout out Bridget and Phil for their leadership throughout all the discussions and meetings. Um, as kind of previously mentioned in, in both Tim and Roach's comments um there you know there there was some disagreement in the group as how to interpret different parts of the charge letter um and, and especially um to which commercial solutions serve as a substitute for the IPLRN solution for smaller carriers um unfortunately we this realization uh, didn't happen until near the end of the working group and therefore, there was little appetite to tackle this among the larger group. Um, the current report outlines the framework where non-TDM providers can contract with TDM or to IP gateway providers to get access to a point of interconnect to a remote WADA in order to fa facilitate NMP. Uh, we believe that this is a suboptimal solution for two reasons. The first is that it continues to perpetuate a TDM uh, interconnection model, which is inconsistent with the Commission's goals around IP interconnection and ensuring the adoption of uh, shake and stir, right, which also requires IP interconnection. And then the second is that it contributes to number exhaust, um, as it requires a new code assignment in order to create an LRN. Um, and I think there's about 245 WADAs. So, you know, you're, you're just propagating uh, the, the TDM solution in order to achieve NMP through commercial agreements. Telmex has prepared a supplemental report uh, for the Nancy's consideration that addresses how commercial agreements can help achieve NMP via the IPLRM framework by leveraging third parties who can provide TDM to IP gateways to non-TDM operators. Essentially, we propose that the commercial agreements model within the IPLRM framework mirrors the 1570 order. But instead of creating backward compatibility, a backward compatibility model, we create a forward compatibility. Excuse me, 
compatibility model uh, by which TDM operators demonstrate an ability to terminate phone calls to IP alerts. Um, you know, we wish to emphasize that IP alert is feasible um, and it minimizes changes to the current industry framework. Um, while I think it's on page 29 of the report um, that states that issues related to IP interconnection, et cetera, and, and much to what Rich was saying earlier, um, need to be addressed in the technology transition docket prior to the implementation of NMP. Telnix believes this step it might be unnecessary. Um, for example, right, Shake and Stir, which is also re relying on IP interconnection and IP technology, has the deadline of July 2021, yet uh, the technology transition docket was not reopened uh, prior to that FCC order. And, and we believe, right, if Congress and if the FCC would like to see Shake and Stir be successful, IPLRN should not only be seen as an NMP solution, but also how does it means to fast track the very thing um, that so many industry participants want, which is IP interconnection. Um, other than those points, Telnix full heartedly supports the working group report. And again, thanks um, and applauds uh, the membership of the working group for their hard work. Thank you, Sarah. Phil or Bridget, do you have any comments to, to Sarah's remarks? Sorry, I think I was on mute. Um, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate you the comments that you shared. And at this time, I don't have any responses or any comments. Okay, this I see Phil Richard. Well. I, I, I'm, go ahead. Sorry, Phil. Oh, oh, no problem. Sorry. I, I don't have any further comments on it okay. as well. Okay, thank you. I see Richard Schrocker, your hand is still up. Is that from a previous question or do you have a follow up question? No, that was from the previous question. Thank you. I have nothing more. Tim Cagle, I see your hand is raised. Do you have a follow-up question, or is that from a previous question? Um, it's not necessarily a follow-up question, Marilyn, but this is Tim Cagle again. Um, so again, I want to be very complimentary to the working group and the hard work invested in this report. It's a very difficult subject. Sometimes it can be an emotional subject, but as I reviewed the report, it seems that um, the output may not quite have met, may not quite have hit the target in terms of how can this effort be moved forward. So, for example, there are a number of policy questions to be examined. It would have seemed relevant to me that those policy questions would have been clearly identified in the summary. And as part of the summary, that if commercial solutions were viable options, that that should also have been enumerated in the summary. And the report, as I read it, seemed to focus more on an IPLRN-centric solution and not the NGLRN solution or the commercial agreement solution um, that were, I think, clarified in earlier remarks by by both Bridget and by uh, Richard Shockey. So it would be for those reasons that Comcast would go on the record as not supporting this particular report without further clarification of what clearly needs to be done here, what are the next steps, what are the timing of those next steps, so that we can come to, we can bring this matter to a a successful conclusion for the uh, for the original charge, and and that concludes my remarks, so, Marilyn. Thank you. This is Phil Lindsay with CenturyLink. If I may respond to that a little bit, 
Um, yes, please do. So that was actually a question that was raised at the very beginning of this working group's um, efforts. And it was taken back to the FCC um, to provide any kind of guidance in order for us to address those other alternatives. And it was uh, basically decided that, uh, you know, the, the primary goal was to address this IPLRN. And so this report addresses specifically what the FCC's charge letter put forth. And I, you know, I regret that you, uh, that, that there is um, any um, um, lack of support of this report due to the way that the report was charged to the working group. I think that's unfortunate. Um, and it was explicit throughout the work that this working group, uh, uh, as we worked through the issues, that we exclude specifically those um, other alternatives from this report. So I just want to make that clear and that it wasn't necessarily something that was uh, an omission or um, um, an over oversight on the part of the working group. It was very much in at front of mind. Tim, this is Rich Shockey. Let me, let, let me back up. Uh, or and totally agree with Phil Lindsay about this because uh, a lot of us in the very beginning had issues with the charge letter itself. Okay, that it implied uh, a support for IPLRNs that some of us really did not have. But you know, given the charge letter there was really little or no choice for the working group to proceed the way it did. This is Rosemary with T-Mobile. I just want to chime in really quick and say I was part of this process the entire time, and I support Phil Lindsay's comments as to our charge. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, Rosemary, and Richard. I do not see any other hands raised, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Bridget and Phil, thank you very much for the discussion. Um, I will open the meeting for a motion to approve the Nationwide Number Portability Working Group Report and Recommendations um, on a path for implementing the Internet Protocol Local Routing Number Solution. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve? Um, Chairman McKee, Chair McKee, yes. this is uh, Sarah Hoka from Telmex. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, because in our comments we mentioned that uh, we were hoping to file a supplement report in addition to the general report, should we address those logistics after the vote or prior to the vote? Um, yes, yes, we can talk about that after the, the vote, Sarah. Thanks for, for raising that. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Otherwise, uh, then I have the first motion to approve. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone to second the motion? This is Bridget. I second. Okay, thank you, Bridget. With that second, we'll submit to the council for a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. okay, and do we have nays? Comcast is a nay. Are there any other nays to Comcast? Okay, Tim, and your, your reason for the nay vote, I think you have explained it in your comments, but could you just briefly state it for the record? Yes, we don't think the report was clear enough on what the specific next step should be with respect to the policy questions, the timing of the review of those next steps, and the uh, additional options that may be available for service providers to move forward. And um, that was really the kind of the summary of our reason for the no vote. 
Okay, great, thank you. Okay, we'll close the voting. Um, the report is approved, um, but we also have, uh, till next we'll be submitting a, a, a minority report um, that they will put together um, explaining the issue that Sarah raised uh, for submission to the commission. And I'd like to thank everyone, um, especially the members of the NNP working group who obviously put in a lot of great work on this item um, and to leadership, uh, Bridget and Phil, thank you very much. Well, well, one, this is Rich Shockey, one question. If Telenex submits a minority report, will there be an opportunity for a rebuttal? That was, that was, this is Rosemary. That was my question. I was, I'm, I don't understand what the summary report is. So if it's a minority report, then Richard, great question. But if it's just a, a summary report, I don't understand what we would do with that. Um, this is Sarah. Hopefully you guys can hear me and I'm off mute. Um, yeah, it, Rosemary and Rich, um, it, you know, it, it could be considered a minority report. Uh, we kind of wanted to tease the term supplemental, um, more of a, a positive spin to it. Um, obviously, we support the, the report um, and, and glad to see it passed. Uh, we just wanted to give a little bit more clarity to the commercial agreement section, um, specifically, you know, that differentiating between uh, general commercial agreements and uh, how commercial agreements can be used within the IPLRN, uh, you know, mechanism itself. Well, um, th th this is Rich Hagen. The question is really for the Nancy chair and for Marilyn, which is obviously we have no document for us to read and, you know, we would like to see it as soon as practically possible. I mean, the full Nancy membership needs to see this. And some of us may have or may not have questions about the, it'll be a minority report, obviously, but you know, we may actually have questions here that some of the members of the NMP uh, working group, as well as Nancy members, could at least point out for clarification some of the issues that Tim Cagle correctly identified. And, you know, certainly I have con serious concerns about, about how far you can take any proposal without revisiting intercarrier compensation and technology transitions. That's really, that's a Maryland question. Maryland? I'm sorry, Rich, I'm not sure I understand your question. The, the question Sarah is, has a minority, if, she has a minority opinion and- She has a minority opinion, but right. would, if she, well, first of all, we, have, we don't know what it is because we can't see it. Um, okay, I thought she explained it. Well, no, she didn't. I mean, I, I okay. until I actually have a document in front of me, I don't know what's really involved here. But the question that I have, and I think Rosemary pointed out, was would we be able to comment on the minority report after it is it is been put together and given to the the FCC? Or do we, or logically, if we wanted to make any comments on the minority report, should we just go straight to an ex parte filing in the docket? So in the past, I, the minority reports have not been available until we've had the discussion. And so they have, a lot of those reports have not been available for the Nancy to see. Um, so I think that would leave the option of Ex parte. Okay, that's that. That is my question. And and this is this is Phil Lindsay with CenturyLink. I wanted to just uh, add a little comment. I think the concept behind a minority report is that it's it's not a an opinion of the overall working group. It's opinion of one entity of the working group, potentially. 
um, and that, you know, that th there isn't necessarily wide support for it, which I think is why it's been characterized as a minority right for it. Okay, Julie Oates, that your hand is raised. Um, thank you. Um, can you can you hear me? I have a Bluetooth on, and I, I can take that off if it's yes, we can hear not you. working. Okay. Um, actually, my my comment um, flows, I think, rather well from what Phil just said. Is um, the way I see it is um, how this is flowing through the discussion is we will be afforded to see the report, but, and it may not be, it, it, it is a minority opinion of the working group, but this being able to see the report will afford the full Nancy to, to see what was discussed um, and not included that was decided among the working group to not be included. So I believe it's, it's wor a worthwhile endeavor to, to, potentially have a discussion about with the full Nancy about what was not um, ultimately included or not agreed upon. Um, fully understand that it, it was something that the majority didn't uh, agree to include, but I, I think it's, it's worthwhile, um, again, to, to have an opportunity, and I, as I understand it, through the ex parte process to, to give that opinion. But I think um, there's a distinction between it's a minority within the working group, but there should be afforded um, the full Nancy to see what that uh, opinion was that wasn't ultimately agreed to. So I, I just wanted to, to throw that out there. I, I see a little bit of a distinction, perhaps without difference, but um, I, I wanted to note that. I look forward to, to seeing the, the write-up. Thank you. Thank and you. and I wanted to um, Ms. Lindsay, one of the co-chairs, um, with regard to the. Um, never mind. I need to pull back. Talk about the minority report. So I'll 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 reserve my comment. Well, this is Rosemary with T-Mobile. I just wanted to quick say that what Julie was saying is how we used to do things back in the, you know, back in the old days when things were really controversial a lot of the time. I can recall one particular time when uh, there was a minority report that came out, like we're talking now, like after the consensus was reached. And I recall that particular carrier uh, was able to present their side of things or their minority opinion um, on the agenda at the next Nancy meeting. And, um, you know, there was a discussion about it. Um, and I remember it because I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, we're going to go rehash this whole thing all over again. This is going to be hard. But you know what? It was really good because time had passed and we could all learn I mean I remember learning a little bit more about their opinion and I, I remember thinking that was a good process so anyway that's it and this is Sarah from Telmex if if the chair and the general Nancy um, think that's appropriate Telmex would be happy to to present at the next meeting That would work for me. So um, if, if that is possibly the way forward, I would just ask um, a, a further point of clarification as to will the, the main report still be sent to the FCC? Um, and if so, will the minority report be sent as well? Um, and will that be before or after a potential presentation or discussion at the next Nancy? So 
this is Jennifer and Marilyn, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the working group report is due to the FCC tomorrow. So we will have to submit the report as filed, and then it is up to Telnex if you want to have your minority report submitted and considered by the commission when it seeks comment, it would need to go at that time. I mean, obviously we can discuss it at the next um, full Nancy meeting in September, but by that point it will already have been sent to the commission. Um, so the question is if you would rather, I, I, it's, I guess it's up to Telnex, so you can include it with the report as a minority report, or you can wait and have discussion and submit it as an ex parte filing at a later date. Um, tell me, you know, Telnex can go both ways. So I think we we would uh, want the minority report attached um, and, and sent to the commission um, tomorrow to meet that deadline. Uh, but we would still be happy to have another discussion uh, regarding our minority report in in September. So if we can do both, I think that that would work for us. Okay, Marilyn, does that make sense from the FCC side? Uh, from the FCC side, yes, but from the Nancy side, do the Nancy members have any thoughts about that? All in favor say aye. Julie's hand is I, up again. Julie, is your hand up? Okay. Yes, my hand is up. Um, I was supporting, I, I would support um, the proposal that Sarah made on behalf of Telnex to um, attach the minority report, which, which I appreciate her, um, Telnex's position to, to say more of a supplement. I, I appreciate the camaraderie there to say that we support the ultimate um, report, but we would like to have a further discussion. So I support what she um, has offered to do both. Tim Cagle, Comcast. Yes, right. thank you, Marilyn. Yeah, so I would just echo uh, Julie's sentiments there. Comcast would be supportive of Telnex submitting their Minority report is an attachment to the full NNP report. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Okay, if anybody else, Marilyn? Nope, no other hands are raised. Okay, then I think we have a plan, everyone. Thank you all very much um, for your input. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, the other members of the working group, and that is how we will proceed. Now we've come to the public participation portion of the meeting. Um, in the public notice for this meeting, which was released on May 27th, members of the public were directed to submit any comments via the Commission's electronic comment filing system and docket number CC92-237. Does the FCC staff see any comments from members of the public in the docket? Uh, no, Madam Chair, uh, we do not. Okay. Then, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we will also accommodate public participation through the live questions at FCC.gov email address. Have we received any questions via email to read aloud? We have not received any questions there either. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, now, do any uh, Nancy members have any other business they wish to address at this time? Okay, hearing nothing, then I just want to remind everybody that our next Nancy meeting is scheduled for September 24th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, Bruce, is there anything you want to add? Nothing further at this time. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Um, Marilyn, anything else from the commission? No, thank you. Oh, thank you, Marilyn. Okay, then um, if there's nothing else, I want to thank you all very much for your time today. Um, please stay safe, and uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone.